though my watch is on camera time that got confusing this is uh who is it sorry last conversation paul yes sorry we just had mark and he was cool too but you're the cool presentation after oh yeah just to make it difficult for me yeah so this is paul he's talking about Cyclones? No. He's talking about something. I'm sorry. <laughs> Have fun. Yeah. Um, I can't. Yeah. High performance and scalable updates. Sounds cool. Enjoy your presentation. Big round of applause for Paul. Thank you, Rachel. All kidding aside. So um, I've been doing the read mostly thing for a long time, and uh, a series of rather strange accidents got me into the update side a little bit, at least. Uh, and uh, here we have the real presenter walking in here. Uh, <laughs> um, we're doing the younger crowd. This is uh, getting starting early. We figure we get them in the kernel that way. Anyway, um, talk a little bit about before the Issaquah we'll challenge, uh, the challenge itself, and uh, why parallel updates aren't a, or aren't always a solved problem and talk about uh, one solution. Uh, this is, I should warn you ahead of time, this is a case of conference-driven development. And that means that I work on it for a few days before each conference. And so it isn't quite uh, as uh, pristine as uh, some of the stuff I might do in the Linux kernel, where I have to get it right before, before Ingo Molnar and then Linus Torvalds will, will deign to accept it. Uh, so, but, you know, uh, you've got to have some fun, so here we are. So before the Issaquah challenge, it, it, it seems that uh, I have an interesting relationship with the transactional memory guys. Um, and it's not like I'm opposed to transactional memory, it's just that uh, we don't necessarily see eye to eye technically. Uh, and this is especially the case around 2005, where they would write papers saying things like, you can't make a double-ended queue uh, that uses just locking and get concurrency uh, so that you know, somebody can enqueue and dequeue from both ends at the same time. And uh, the reason they say that, I mean, they had a good rationale. It's not like they were being totally stupid. Um, the, uh, are you guys reading something into that statement I just said? Uh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. As long as we're being friendly, it's okay. Anyway, the, the thing is, is that if you're on the top there, if you have four elements in this double-ended queue, clearly somebody can dequeue. Obviously, they enqueue both ends without any interference whatsoever. One of them is going to be messing with the right head in D, and the other one with A in the left head. There's no overlap, so you don't even need to have any mutual exclusion. It's just work. And a deletion, the same deal. I mean, you know, looking at the two elements, that works fine. In fact, if you're down to three elements, it still works. The reason it works, when you're deleting, it's a little trickier. You probably have a double linked list, and they're both going to hit B, but they're going to hit different pointers in B. Okay? So that'll work, too. But as soon as you get down to two elements, life gets hard. Because uh, if you are kind of stupid about it, They'll both grab A and B, but they'll link the things to the, each other, and it'll just be a mess. Because the guy removing B will say, all right, I'm going to make the right head point to A. Except the other guy removed it at the same time, so his left head points to B, and, and life gets very bad very quickly. And worse, if you've only got one element, and the two guys are trying to dequeue it, if you don't have synchronization between them, um, it might, they might both get A, or both decide the list was empty, both of which are grossly illegal. Now... Um, this is another caveat about this talk. I have never, in my entire career, over 40 years, had any use for a double-ended queue. Okay? I mean, I've heard people have. I mean, I've heard people say they have. Dave is... I've actually used it as a, uh, a you know, case for a memory allocator. Okay. Okay. There you are. Um, uh, you had some interesting race conditions to deal with uh, to decide uh, when, the, when the one guy went at 10 elements, but let's, let, we'll take that offline. This, this could be a while. Um, in any case, um, it turns out, uh, so this, is, this slide is wrong. There is apparently some point to at least one person in this room has had some use for this data structure sometime in their career. Um, uh, th but uh, it turns out there is a simple solution. And... Uh, uh, I have a, I'll have it at the end. The uh, transactional memory guys were actually really cool about it. Uh, they wrote a couple of papers where they cited it and included in their performance results and said very nice things about, uh, about it, and it did quite well. Um, but, you know, there's always another shoe that drops, right? I mean, you know, that was one shoe. Where's the other shoe? 
And so we'll fast forward to uh, early this year, 2014, at the C++ Standards Committee meeting in Issaquah, Washington. Um, this is not too, it's, it's essentially a suburb of Seattle. And uh, they were, they, they're trying to standardize transactional memory and add it to C and C++, not initially at the standard itself, but to make a, uh, they call it a technical report or a technical specification, which is kind of off to the side of the standard. It isn't part of the standard, but allows people doing it to collaborate and uh, debug that part of the standard before they add it. And, uh, you know, um, I'm, I actually participate in that group. Um, I'm not uh, a particular fan or a detractor of transactional memory. It's, it's there. But uh, if they're going to add it, I would rather they didn't uh, disadvantage my employer's hardware. And so my participation has been uh, more more participation than you might expect. Anyway, so they presented a thing. They were saying, okay, here are the reasons we, we need transactional memory. This was an example of one of them, atomically moving something from one tree to another um, and possibly back. Uh, and they had a bunch of other examples. They were kind of doing a dry run for the presentation. And it was late in the evening, and I was having a heck of a time keeping my tongue bit because, you know, I'm supposed to be the loyal opposition, right? Uh, and it was getting hard to stay loyal because it was like every time they put this like, you, you, you know, because every one of them was like, there's a way of doing this. Um, but, um, you know, I, I didn't want to mess things up. Anyway, so at the end of it, and, and there's some other conditions here, uh, you, you have to view these moves without contending between the two operations. All right. In other words, you should be able to move element four from the right to the left without interfering with the movement of element one from the left to the right, you know, without any coordination or any cache line sharing or anything, right? Um, and what that means, of course, is that normal solutions like locking one tree or having a lock for both trees or even anything else just don't work. They don't meet that sort of thing. Anyway, at the end of the spiel, um, I was going, oh my God, it's finally done, thank you. Uh, and uh, the guy leaning up says, okay, I think we've got a good case. Uh, and I think we can present this, but we are missing the actual algorithms using locking. McKinney, would you like to do that? <laughs> of course, there's kind of a subtext. Okay, McKinney, if you think you're so smart, let's see you do this. <laughs> but, you know, after biting my tongue for a few hours, it's a great relief to say yes. <laughs> anyway, uh, one thing you say is, well, geez, we've been doing parallel updates for longer than I've been alive, and that's saying something, okay? Um, you know, why is this a problem? I mean, use a hash table, right? What could be simpler? You can, you can map a hash tree into a hash table if you really want to. Some databases do it. And uh, you partition it up, you have a lock on each chain, you hash the stuff across, and you know, perfect scalability, stunning performance is great, in theory. On uh, recent machines, uh, you might see something like that. Now, the top two lines, top three lines, the top one is the ideal. You just take without locks and extrapolate. Uh, R2 and hazard pointers are pretty close to that. I'm not going to worry about hazard pointers, but it's a well-known uh, thing that kind of does it kind of does what RCU does, different properties. Uh, use per bucket locks. This is a read-only workload. All we're doing is acquiring the locks. Everything's random. It's spread out. You know, it should be perfect. That's what we get. It goes up to eight CPUs and drops. This is a log scale. It drops a long ways. I mean, this really is bad. Of course, we knew a global lock was going to be trouble, and it is. So we've got this thing that, in theory, we're, we're, we're not even doing updates. We're just acquiring the locks to protect the reads, all right? And it falls off a cliff. We don't have hotspots. We don't have false sharing, you know? Okay, well, the usual thing is, all right, fine. You don't have enough, you don't have enough buckets, right? I mean, that would be your first, first thing you suspect, and that's actually true in this case. We have 1,024 buckets, and if we go to 2048, it gets a lot better. Uh, we'll get a little better at, at between 8192 and 16384. We don't see much change. But still, even at 16,000 buckets, it's still dr dropping off a cliff. This is a linear scale, all right? So the cliff is a lot shorter than the 1,024, but there's still a cliff. This is on x86 hardware, you know? A couple generations old, but still there. So we've got some improvement that the basic problem of it not scaling is still there. The problem is, is that it's a four-socket machine. When we run with eight CPUs, 
the way that Intel, in their infinite wisdom, numbers their CPUs, those are each on a core, and uh, those are confined to one socket. We add the ninth CPU, we go off on another socket. And suddenly our cache misses get way more expensive. The workload is randomly hitting the different hash buckets. And that means the lock you acquire is probably last acquired by somebody else. Therefore, even though there's no contention, the data structure containing that lock is in the other guy's cache, and we have to go out across the internet over, over there a long ways to get it. And you know, the speed of light is pretty fast if so you're trying to run to keep up with it, but you know, um, at, uh, what, this is a two gigahertz machine. It's about that far over and back, speed of light in a vacuum. All right, not very far. Well, the chip's smaller than that, so what's the problem? Um, except that, you know, uh, I don't know of any computers that use vacuum light guides, you know, wave guides or whatever to transfer, you know, data across. It's all like silicon and, and copper and aluminum. And uh, in copper, you might get 30% of the speed of light. In silicon, which is, by the way, what the transistors are, um, you're, you're doing really good to get 3% of the speed of light. And so instead of something like that, we're talking, you know, we're talking smaller than a chip for a big high-performance chip. So we have a problem, and that's what was happening to those hash things. In fact, we have two problems. And according to a guy named Stephen Hawking, these are fundamental problems. He visited Intel Research and, and actually came up with these two, and I'm bumming off of him. The first one is that uh, the speed of light is finite, as we saw on the previous slide. And we haven't figured out a way to make information go faster than the speed of light. Although there was some false alarm about neutrinos a couple years ago at uh, one of the national labs in the US. So um, we can only go so fast, as far as we know. And uh, right now, everything we do is made out of atoms. And the atoms only get so small. Um, about, it was about seven years ago, I saw a scanning electron microscope of a cross-section of a transistor. And uh, there were about this many atoms across the base. And the base of the transistor is a layer in the middle. And uh, that's what controls the speed the transistor can switch at. Um, they have actually made research prototypes that look like that, one atom thick layer for the base. I'm sorry? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, uh, I didn't ask. Uh, let, let me know how, what you find out when you check into that. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we take atoms for granted. They may be bitching at us all the time. We wouldn't know. <laughs> you should definitely take a look at that. Um, and I don't know what they're using in production, but they might be down that thin. I don't know. But it's definitely less than five atoms. And so there's some limits on how far we can go. One of the cool things about read mostly, I mean, I've been doing it the easy way for all my time with RCU and things like that, because the read-only data gets replicated across the caches of all the CPUs that use it. And that's that little black square you can see in each of the little green areas there. Uh, so if all the CPUs are reading a given value, it'll appear in all the caches and have very small distance to get to it, and it'll be very high-speed access. Works out really nicely. Uh, it works out nicely, that is, until the first time you update it. So let's say the CPU down here updates that same variable, and all of a sudden, bang, it gets yanked out of all the other CPU's caches and appears only in this CPU's cache. Well, first off, that update um, is going to do a slow operation. It's going to have to go and talk to all the CPU's to rip that cache line out of their cache. And then all the other CPU's, the next time they read it, are going to have to go talk to this CPU a long ways away to get it back out. And so that's part of the pain of doing updates. Well, you know, doctor, it hurts when I do updates. What's the doctor say? <laughs> exactly. You guys are with it here. Exactly. Then don't do <laughs> updates. Well, you know, the, the, the reply back, of course, is, uh, well, if I don't do updates, I run out of registers. <laughs> I mean, some algorithms don't, and, and they're, they're in great shape with this advice, but the stuff I work with uh, doesn't fit in the machine register, sorry. And uh, as a result, we really don't have any choice but to do updates at some point or another. Uh, but what we're going to have to do is be very careful about how we do the updates. And there's actually some ways of dealing with this. There are some special cases where you can do updates at full rate, um, at the full machine rate. Um, and they're used really, really heavily uh, in, in the Linux kernel and other places. I mean, it was, uh, I first came across this in the early 90s, and it was considered to be an old technique at that time. And of course, I'm talking about um, the, the uh, per CPU things like split counters. You just put a counter on each CPU or on each thread, you know, and go from there. There's also read-only traversal to the location being updated. 
Um, so this lesson here is when you're doing an update, update only what you have to update. Don't do updates of stuff that isn't involved in the update. And we'll look more at that. And of course, uh, perhaps this uh, trivial lock-based concurrent DQ that I teased you with earlier in the presentation. So split counters. Um, how many people have used uh, split counters per CPU counters or per thread counters? Yeah, good, we got some people doing it. Uh, it's straightforward. Um, this is a little misleading. You would not put the counters right next to each other. You would have at least a cache line's worth between them. And in fact, normally you have all the per CPU variables run CPU in one clump, and somewhere else all the counters for another one. But, and yeah, if, uh, Christoph has some kind of an allocator he says does something about that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to allocate per CPU variables in Linux kernel, talk to Christoph. <laughs> I even use it, I think, or do I? I can't remember. Oh, those, the SRCU uses it. Um, in any case, what happens is that you, if you're doing an increment, in other words, you're doing an update, you increment your counter and only your counter. And that means it stays in your cache and, and you get full speed at it. Now, if somebody wants to read this thing, they're going to have to do some more work. They have to sum all the counters up, which is slow. But... Um, uh, if you're, for example, in networking, so we have Jesper here, what happens is you'll have packets coming in. So if, what, what's, the, what's the biggest pack per second rate you got on a machine? It's like millions. I remember that, but I can't remember how many million. I'm trying to reach 14 14 million. Okay, so what are you at now? That's what you're trying to reach. Yeah, I'm, I think I go up to 9 million. 9 million. Okay, so he's got a machine that's going to increment its counter 9 million times a second. He said, he's, he's got some, well, otherwise he wouldn't have any work to do. He's got to have, you know, he'll give the guy a chance to do some work. Uh, I, I'd like to do 56 million. 56 million, okay. Um, so in that case, you're not going to, if you're doing 56 million per second, you're not going to do a huge amount of cash misses. Uh, in fact, not very many at all. Uh, in any case, um, the thing is, is that he's, so he's got this thing, he's doing about 9 million packets per second, but... It's like a system administration thing to look and see, well, how many packs this machine sent, and maybe you'll do that every five seconds if you're really worried about it. And so what's happening is that the, the read is very rare and the update very common, and this is a great way to optimize very heavily for the update. Okay, so what that means is we don't have to have, I mean, it's not necessary that updates are guaranteed to slow us down. At least in some special cases, we can uh, make use of some tricks to make the updates fast, uh, possibly expensive the reads. And it turns out there's a whole bunch of ways of skinning that counting cat. I've got a book that has a, ch a whole chapter on different things you can do, and you can make the, you can make the reads and the updates fast, um, but what happens is the, is the change in value propagates fairly slowly from the updaters to the readers, and there's a bunch of other, other tricks you can play. Okay, um, so counting is great, but uh, uh, and sometimes counting is the whole problem, but most of the time you're doing something and you're counting it. So we need something else besides counters, and for at least for some software. So one trick is, uh, is fairly common. You've got a fairly large data structure. You're updating part of it, maybe any particular part, but the update is fairly small. For example, you might add or delete something to a, to a binary search tree, which is the problem I was uh, tasked with in Issaquah last February. Uh, or you might have a hash table has the same sort of thing. Uh, graphs, any number of things are kind of like that, where you'll traverse something and then do an update in one location. Now, the classic methodology isn't all that smart about this, um, with one exception we'll get to, and that has to do with tree balancing, which uh, I was allowed to ignore, because they can't do balanced trees fast with transactional memory, so I don't have to either. <laughs> so I get to pre-balance them, not worry. Uh, actually, uh, uh, having uh, balancing algorithms for concurrent binary trees is a very heavy-duty research topic right now. There's a lot of people trying to figure out ways of making that work. Uh, but um, I figured I'd uh, stick with the challenge I was given because I'm cowardly and all that. <laughs> so the classic thing, you'd lock the root, you'd uh, use a key comparison to select a descendant, you'd lock the descendant, release the lock on the root, and you keep doing that. And uh, that's fairly classic. It's been around for a long time. We've been doing that forever in databases and other things. Uh, but you know, the lock condition on the root is going to really be a problem. All right? That's just not going to be fun at all. Um, and it, if you did this, it clearly doesn't qualify as a solution to the Issaquah challenge because there will be contention between two different updates to, the, to that tree. And so this is just need not apply. And that's why we have RCU. I'm going to kind of give a really quick run through RCU. I, could, I have a guest lecture I do at universities from time to time that runs between one and two hours. 
and so I'm not doing that here. Um, at the end of this presentation, the slides will be available. In this presentation, there's a bunch of places you can go to look to find more information. This is just kind of give a really quick, glossy, um, high-speed fire hose overview. So the problem we have is that we have these expensive operations. We had this hash table back there a ways, and we had per bucket locks, and acquiring those locks was really expensive if they weren't, if there was no locality. And so back to the, uh, it hurts when I do that doctor approach, we can say, well, let's just not use expensive operations. All right? And so I'm going to propose the, uh, I'm going to argue these are the, the uh, lightest weight possible operations, and those are, that's just C, pound sign defined, RC read lock, new line. If you look in the Linux kernel, there'd be more stuff there, but it's debug, and so it doesn't do anything. It disappears in a, in a production build. And if pound sign defined, RC read lock, unlock nothing. All right, and this may seem a little extreme. Um, uh, maybe you can do better. Uh, that'll require no negative overhead. If you do that, I want to know about it. It'd be really cool. But until somebody actually shows me something like that, I'm claiming this is the best you can do. And this may seem a bit extreme. I'm reminded of a sign that uh, an old, uh, you know, big white beard, long, long hair, white hair guy that I worked with in the early 90s had a sign in his cube. And the sign said, only those who have gone too far can possibly tell you how far you can go. So you know, let's go all the way and see what happens. Now I assert this gives you the best possible performance, scalability, real-time response, weight freedom, and energy efficiency. So we got some benefits we get. Uh, one question, if you haven't dealt with RCU before, and even maybe if you have, is uh, we, you, these things clearly aren't affecting machine state. In fact, uh, with this, they're not even making it to the back end of the compiler, right? I mean, not only are they not emitting any instructions, but the back end of the compiler doesn't know they exist. And so a reasonable question at this point is if it doesn't affect machine state, how the heck do you use it as a synchronization primitive? That's a valid question. Uh, we'll get there. But uh, let's start by saying, OK, let's say that the readers don't affect machine state. And we want to add something to this pointer. So we got a sequence of four states with three transitions, time advancing from left to right. So we start off with the CPTR, which is the pointer. And we're going to make it point something. And we're going to do that in a way that the readers can just go flying in any time they want. I mean, clearly, if, if the reader starts with pound sign with you know, RC read lock being nothing, uh, there's nothing that the updater is doing to block them. There's no way to do that. And there's not even any way to tell whether the reader's there or not. So if we can make something that adds to the structure without that knowledge, we've got at least part of the problem solved. So what we do is we allocate a new data structure. And this temporary pointer points to it that's presumably on the stack of the guy doing the update. And it's garbage. And then we initialize it. And now it's got some values for its fields that are predicted. And then, uh, and then we do RCU assign pointer, which is, think of it as an assignment statement. We just assigned TMP to CPDR, so that now it points to it. But it, this prevents the CPU and the compiler from doing nasty things to us, which it, they would do otherwise. And then the readers are coming in with RCU dereference. Again, this is an assignment statement that prevents uh, CPUs and compilers from doing nasty things to us. And what happens here is uh, this assignment is atomic in the sense that if a reader in concurrently picks up that pointer, that reader will either see the old null value for the pointer, or it will see the new pointer to this data structure. It's not going to see some mush of the two values. All right. And that means readers will either see that structure being there, or they won't. But either way, they'll see a valid thing. They'll either see a valid null pointer, or they'll see a valid pointer to a properly initialized structure. So what this means is that even with this non-existent read side primitive, we can add things to data structures safely. And that's wonderful, but if all we can do is add, uh, we've got a big memory leak. And sooner or later, the machine runs out of memory, and life is hard. So let's see what happens if we delete something. So in this case, we're going to have a linked list, because we have to delete something. And we have some animals. Uh, we're going to delete the cat. And uh, these are marked red because the readers might be there. They might not. The updater has no way of knowing. The updater has to assume there is somebody there because the updater can't tell. So the first thing we do is we remove it from the list by making the BOAS pointer point to the GNU. So it hops over the cat. And this this List LRCU is atomic in the same sense. It stores the new pointer. The readers either see a pointer to the cat or they see a pointer to the new. They don't see some mush of the two pointers. So either way, they may see a list with the cat. They may see a list without the cat. Either way, they see a valid list. 
Now, if we have this magic operation synchronized RCU that somehow knows how to wait for all the readers that aren't giving an indication they're there, if it can somehow wait for all of them to get done, it doesn't have to wait for all the readers, just the old ones. I mean, it only has to wait for the readers that uh, got to the pointer before it got changed. Because the new readers at this point don't have any way to get to the cat. So we only have to wait for the old readers. But if we do wait for the old readers somehow, and all, the, all those old readers get done and leave the data structure, then nobody can be, except the updater, can be referring to the cat. That's why it's color green. It was yellow when only the old people get at it. Now it's green because nobody except the updater has a reference to it. And then we can do whatever we want with it, including just freeing it, which is what we do here. All right? So if we have a magic operation that waits for the old readers and only the old readers, it can wait longer if it wants to, but it has to wait for all the old readers, then we can safely yank that thing out of the data structure and just destroy it. And uh, again, this is kind of a brief overview. Um, I'll have some, some places you can look for more information later, but uh, to give you sort of a flavor for what's happening. And it turns out you actually can implement this if you have a non-preemptive environment. An example non-preemptive environment is the Linux kernel when it's built with config preempt equals n. Now, if you build with, if you have a non-preemptive environment and you have a pure spin lock, which the Linux kernel has, you say spin lock the lock, you say spin unlock to release it. One of the rules is that you do not block while holding that spin lock. Reason you don't block is let's say you have two CPUs. One CPU grabs a spin lock and then blocks. The other CPU says, okay, I want that spin lock. Well, it spins because it can't have it. And it's a spin lock, so it just keeps spinning until it does get it. Let's say the first CPU runs some other task. I mean, the other guy blocked, right? And that wants the spin lock too, so it spins waiting for the lock. Now we're deadlocked. The two guys spinning on the CPU can't get the lock until the guy releases it. The guy who holds the lock can't possibly release it until it gets the CPU. And the guy spinning the lock aren't going to let go of their CPU until they get the lock. So, you know, we're done. So therefore, if you're in a non-preemptive environment and you have a pure spin lock, you do not block while holding spin lock. We apply that same rule to RC readers. If you've done RC read lock, you are not allowed to block until you do the corresponding RC read unlock. What that means is that if people are following the rules, you have to follow the rules, if they are, then as soon as CPU zero does a context switch, we know all the readers are done on that CPU because they aren't allowed to block. See that blue thing there that started with an RC read lock and it ended with an RC read unlock? If that, that guy's not allowed to block inside of there, so there can't be any context switch, switches inside that RC read side critical section. So once we see that CPU context switching, then we know, great, that all the previous readers on that CPU were done. And then uh, we got one immediately with synchronized RCU because it immediately blocks. And then finally, when the CPU one does its context switch, at that point, all the CPUs have done a context switch. And we know that in each of those context switches has been after we removed the cat. Therefore, we know there are no readers referenced in the cat. So at this point, the grace period is ended. We can free the cat. Nobody's looking at it. It's a little bit weird. Um, it's uh, one of these things that's simple, but you have to think about it kind of upside down. And so, you know, if, you, if it doesn't make sense on the first round, don't worry about it. Uh, try it again later. And it, it'll, it's, uh, I had a heck of a time with the recursion, and uh, people have a same, similar problem with RCU. So I guess I'm getting back for my uh, tortures in, in uh, school. Yeah? Could you give a quick example of a blocking operation you're not allowed to do? Um, okay. Can I give a quick example of a blocking operation you're not allowed to do? Uh, wait for a, for a network packet to come in, or um, a timed wait. Um, you know, a, uh, uh, in user space, it'd be a sleep of five or something like that. In the kernel, it'd be uh, uh, scheduled timeout interruptible or something like that of whatever jiffies. So th anything like that. Take a sleeping lock. <laughs> Take a sleeping lock. Uh, acquire, a, acquire a semaphore or a, or a lock that blocks is another, another good one. Yeah. A new reader that wouldn't have. Okay, so yeah, that's that's a good point. So let me let me make sure I understand the question. If I understand correctly, the question is: We got CPU one, and it's got this reader here, the first one, that might see the cat because it started before the cat was removed. But these other two here, they can't possibly get to the cat. Um, 
because they started after it was removed. That's true. What we're doing is we're being more conservative than we have to. I mean, we could, if you look at it and say, okay, when are the readers done? We could have let go right here because we know by looking at the diagram that all the readers that had access got done at this point. But that would mean we'd have to have a non-empty RC read lock and RC read unlock. Doing it this way, we're being a little more conservative. We're taking more time than we have to. But the return we get from that is very, very lightweight, as in zero cost, reads that operations. Right. No, no, yeah. That's right. We are, we are waiting for readers with this algorithm that we don't, strictly speaking, need to wait for. Um, wouldn't uh, waiting for all the CPUs to do a context switch so that you know they're all done require hitting some global memory? Wouldn't uh, waiting for, wouldn't, uh, yeah, so it does. Um, and the trick, nasty trick we use here is that context switches are fairly expensive. And the extra instrumentation that RCU puts on it is, by comparison, insignificant. But yes, there is some cost. We, what we've done is we've piggybacked on top of an expensive operation <laughs> and kind of buried the, buried the cost there. Okay, so that's kind of a rough, a really quick overview of, of RCU. We'll go back to this bit about synchronizing without changing machine state. Because remember, one of the objections, and I've gotten this objection really loud, and I've gotten people who've just really gotten my face and screamed at me about it, um, is you know, we've got these RCU read locks that don't do anything. How can they possibly be involved in synchronization? They don't change the machine state. Well, the trick is they don't have to. They act not on the machine hardware, but on the developer. The developer has to follow this rule that you're not allowed to block while you're in a read side critical section. Therefore, RCU is an example of synchronization via social engineering. And that's one of the reasons that it's kind of weird to think about and why people have a hard time with it, because it's not, it's not working with the machine. People are used to synchronization being just the machine. That's not the way RCU works. Yes? I think, I think I'll, uh, the, the, let, me, let me repeat the question here, the, uh, the, or the objection, which was that uh, given that there's all this debug code in the Linux kernel, doesn't that mean that synchronization via social engineering doesn't work? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to defer to uh, Dave Tinner's talk yesterday, which is that people cannot program. <laughs> But that's, yeah, we do have debugging code. Um, we, people aren't always good at following the rules, <laughs> including me. Also, what sleeps and blocks can be multiple levels down. Uh, and so you've got absolutely no idea that the code that you just called does actually block. And so it's a, it's a, it's a trap that there's other things that we'll find. So um, anyway, uh, the thing is, is that Every other synchronization mechanism also has a social engineering component. If you use locking, it's your responsibility to make sure that you access the protected variables only while holding the lock. Now, the lock's not going to enforce that. You have to. What's different about RCU isn't that it has social engineering, but that it's only social engineering. It has no mechanical component to it. Although, again, if you're doing it in a different environment, for example, if you're a preemptible kernel or in some versions of user space, there will be a little bit of work that RC read lock and RC read unlock have to do for those variants. But for this pure variant, this is the first one we came up with long, long ago. Um, there's nothing but social engineering involved. OK, well, all right. So this, if we have RCU, we can do better, a better job of doing read-only traversal to the update location. Remember before we're getting a lock of the root node, which is a real bad idea because everybody's going to hit the root node and it's going to be a massive contention. It's going to go slow. It's not going to scale. What we do instead is we enter a read-side critical section and we go start at the root, root of the tree, but we don't lock it. And we just go traversing the tree without locking until we find the node that we want to update. Then we acquire the locks. Um, of course, there may be several other people doing the same thing at the same time with the same nodes. So after we acquire the locks, we have to do some consistency checks because the world may have changed. Those two nodes may have been deleted from the tree entirely. Okay, they can't have been freed because they're still in RC read side critical section, but they might have been removed. So we'll have to do some checking to make sure the tree is still in a shape that allows us to do our update. And if it isn't, we'll have to retry the, the access. We have to start over at the root. Um, if it is all consistent, we can carry the update and get back out. And that means we don't have any contention on the root node, unless we're updating the root node itself, um, which I avoid in my cheat there. Um, 
So what you can do is you can put remove flags, for example, on the data elements. So if you remove it, you're, you, have, you hold the lock on the element, you're removing it, you set a flag inside saying, hey, this has been deleted, then you release the lock. When somebody else comes along having found the same element because they got there before you actually deleted it, they look and see there's a deleted element, and they say, okay, I'll pretend I didn't find this and start over. And I'm not going to go through this in detail, but that's what this does. Um, it basically leaves state saying this thing has been removed so the people that come in afterwards can fix up and get out. Anyway, the idea of this is to focus the contention only on the part of the data structure that's actually being updated. The rest of the data structure you just traverse in a read side critical section and let RCU keep you from being sent off into the free list. And this has actually been around for a long time in one form or another, and uh, I'm not going to go through those in detail. You're, uh, we'll have, again, we'll have the slides up at some point. You can look at them. And we can use this as the basis for one solution to the Issaquah problem. What we're going to do is we're going to have the tree be protected by different synchronization primitives in different parts of the tree. And it's a little more complicated than this because you might have an unbalanced tree, but if it is perfectly balanced, everything down to the, except for the bottom two layers of the tree are protected by RCU. Below that point, you're using locking for the updates. You will also use RCU to find them. And then uh, we'll be using some tricks to get them to go back and forth. What we end up with is the same tree algorithm we used to do the RCU mapping and the, uh, excuse me, we're going to use a standard tree algorithm with a few changes in a few places to do the existence checks and also to do the consistency checks. So what, what bad thing can happen while you're acquiring the lock? I mean, you're, you go down and you find the things you want, you acquire their locks, and then somebody else is messing with you. They got the locks first, so, you know. Um, one thing that could happen is that both of the nodes might have disappeared in which case the both will have deleted flag set. You'll look at them and you go, Oop, okay, forget this and start over. It's possible that the parent was deleted and the child was moved somewhere else. The same deal, you'll see the deleted flag set. The child might have been deleted and the parent might have been somewhere else. Uh, one that I found out about the hard way is they're both still there, but some stuff got stuck between them. <laughs> and uh, that's pretty bad because if you're assuming they still point to each other, then uh, you just mess the tree up pretty badly. And uh, A little fun debugging that. Uh, so obviously I was not programming to Dave's point yesterday. <laughs> so what we're going to do, um, the thing is, we, it's not enough to pull stuff in and out of the tree. We have to do it atomically. And uh, we're going to solve yet another computer science program, problem, excuse me, by adding another level of indirection. I mean, what else do you do, right? And uh, there are better ways to do this uh, or... Well, we don't know what's better or worse yet. There are ways involving fewer levels of indirection to do this, but we'll mention those shortly. Um, we have our data structure, and we have a pointer that we add to each element in the data structure. And that pointer points to normally be null, and we'll get to that in a moment. But it, the thing is being moved to the point to this existence structure which has an offset. And the existence pointers, all of them point to this yellow box. So all of these things point to the yellow box. The offsets may be different. Here we just have 0 and 1. We only have two states. You could have more if you wanted. And then the existence switch points either to the array on the top or the array on the bottom. So what happens is that we go in. We say, oh, the existence pointer is non-null, so we find that. Remember the offset 0. Find the switch. It currently points up there. Offset 0 is 1. This thing here therefore exists. The guy on the bottom at the same time, we go, we pick it up. Oh, offset 1, great. Existence switch points up there. 0. This guy does not exist. The nice thing about this is we can do a single store to that yellow box and suddenly be pointing to this array with different outcomes for, those, for that check. So we can have an arbitrary number of elements at the top existence thing there with offset 0. We have another arbitrary group of data structures pointing to the bottom one with offset 1. We can do a single store to that existence switch and atomically make the whole lot on top disappear and atomically with that, make the whole lot on the bottom appear. All right? And so that's, that's kind of the basic trick we're going to use. And uh, we'll, we can animate it, right? I mean, the guys are coming in, they're gone. They're in, they're gone, right? Um, the little dottedness on the arrow there, it's a little subtle. Okay, so we do that single store, and we can make an arbitrarily large group of changes appear atomically. Uh, this is just C code that goes with the existence part. Um, I'm not going to go with that in great detail. 
And uh, I'm going to demonstrate with a tree, but I'm not a good enough artist to like put one of those in everywhere. It would fill up the slide and I, uh, it'd be a mess. So I'm going to abbreviate it like that. And so I have pointers coming to this little box. And a pointer coming to the one is like going, a pointer to the bottom existence pointer there. And a pointer to the zero is like to the top. Okay, and so this is after the switch has been done. Um, and so the red and blue tell you whether it exists or not, essentially. A color hint to go along with the zero and the one. Okay, there's some objections to this. I added three levels of interaction, not just one. And even by computer science uh, standards, that may be considered excessive. On the other hand, most of the time, elements aren't being moved. And during those times, you can use a null pointer. All right? And null pointers are cheap. You say, oh, it's null. Now, this is confusing because if the pointer's null, it means the, the element exists. And I'll guarantee you I get that backwards every time I've tried to do that. Therefore, we have an API. <laughs> Um, and in the, uh, only in the uncommon case where the element is actually in the process of being atomically moved somewhere, then and only then we have a pointer we have to go through. Um, and there's no free lunch. I mean, that, that actually is expensive. There are mobile cache misses. And, but in the uncommon case, um, if a given element isn't being moved very often, this is, should be perfectly acceptable. Uh, we do have to use more expensive, expensive operations to traverse those lists. Uh, because we want it to appear atomic, we have to use something like SMP load acquire. We can't use um, read once, access once, or RC to reference in that case, unfortunately. Um, however, we can reduce the number of uh, levels in direction from three to one if we use a trick that Dmitry Vukov uh, pointed out, which is to have the, that pointer coming out of the data structure use a lower bits to have the offset. And then you have uh, many fewer, and then you put in the, in the switch, instead of having a pointer to the array, you just put the bits in there, and then you have one level of direction. Of course, that means you have to give up the bottom bits of your pointer, you know, pick your poison. <laughs> yeah, 10 years ago, I might have been yelled at for that, but no longer, right? <laughs> you know, Dave's point was that that trick's used all over the place in the kernel. Anyway, so um, I think I have enough time to go, kind of go through an uh, animation of this and then performance data. We'll skip a few slides. So we start off like this. We've got elements 1, 2, and 3 in the tree on the left and three, 2, 3, 4 on the tree on the right. Uh, all the pointers for all the nodes, their existence pointer for all null. This node exists, essentially. So the first thing we do is we create an existence pointer, existence structure. And we take 4 and 1 and point it to the one side. They exist still. We allocate the other 4 and the other 1 and point them to the non-exist part. Now, we made a change non-atomically to the original element one and the original element four, and that's okay. The answer is the same, the element exists. It's just that suddenly it's more complicated and expensive to compute it. But before we changed that null pointer, it, didn't ex it existed. When we had a pointer to this stuff, it exists still. So we can take our time populating these existence structures throughout the however many masses of data structures or whatever type we want. Now we insert elements one and four in the tree. We do that non-atomically again. We just do the protection we need to keep the integrity of the data structure. But it's OK. They didn't exist before because there wasn't a pointer to them. They don't exist now because the existence structure says they don't exist. So you know, no big deal. Now we switch that, point, that existence switch. And suddenly, the old stuff doesn't exist anymore, and the new stuff does. That's the part we have to be careful about. That has to be atomic. And then all we have to do is clean up. We null out the pointer to foreign uh, to the new things. They, didn't ex they existed before. They exist now for different reasons. And we disconnect the old things. They didn't exist before for the existence structures. They didn't exist. Now they don't exist because you know, they, there's no path to them. And then we clean up. And uh, you don't have to restrict yourself to trees. You could not potentially move something from a tree to a hash table or something like that. I'm not sure why you would do that. But <laughs> you could have a whole pile of old such restrictions and make their elements all swap back and forth. You don't have to have two states. I just showed two states. You could have a whole pile of them and have a sort of animated GIF of a data structure that just throws things around. And I'm not sure why that would be useful, but you could do it. Anyway, um, I'm not going to go through the API aside from saying it's there. Uh, for read-only, of course, you know, the performance is what you expect. Very good. We get super linear speed-ups, uh, because, and the reason is we have this big tree, and when we have more CPUs, they have smaller parts of the tree in their cache, therefore their accesses are faster. Standard stuff. Uh, there's a mix of operations from a paper in the ACM on transactional memory. I used that. This is not scaled quite as well. It scales okay, but at about 32 CPUs, it, uh, it doesn't scale as much. 
So we get 40x out of 60 CPUs, and that's up from you know one a little bit more uh, a while back. So what's happened here is that um, I haven't really increased the scalability, but I've increased the performance slightly. Um, if we're only moving, in other words, the only operation we're doing on the tree is to move stuff, and that's it. Uh, life isn't quite as good. 100% um, moves, and this is only up to eight CPUs. We're about you know 7.1 now. We were 6.4 in September and 3.7 back in May. This is again conference driven, so those are the conferences. Um, <laughs> Um, if we go to 60 CPUs, um, at 32 CPUs, things heal over, um, and the job now is to find out what that bottleneck is, and uh, maybe it's hardware, in which case I'm stuck, or maybe I've got something stupid, I need, you know, yet another stupid thing I need to deal with. Uh, this is all the stupid things uh, that I've had to deal with. What it, I, we don't know what the heck this thing's useful for. If it is, I was just given a challenge, right? Uh, <laughs> maybe it is, I don't know. <laughs> And uh, yeah, so uh, best guess is if you have a large data structure and you're making small changes to it, but you know maybe it's something that's just there to say yes, I can do that. Damn it. This actually reminds me of a tree based off the atomic tree based off data that does actually already exist mm -hmm. with the existing flags and so on in this world. Um, doing in XFS, there's a, a complex B tree for attributes, and when we do an override of an attribute. Creates a new attribute with a flag that says it doesn't exist. Okay. It then does an atomic swap of the flag between the existing attribute and the new one to swap the states, mm -hmm. and then it removes the old, the old one. So three atomic transactions. Mm -hmm. so it's always consistent on this. Okay. Um, so, so nothing, nothing new under the sun, as they always say. Yeah, Chris, Christoph mentioned, I think it was something else, but Christoph Helwig mentioned some similar thing. What Dave said was that XFS has something that looks like this, although it involves a disk, but, but still, I guess it does have some use. All right. <laughs> anyway, we're kind of out of time, so I'll, uh, I guess I'll mention that uh, right now this is kind of R&D prototype. Uh, if you use it in production, uh, fine, but you know, don't cry to me when it, doesn't, when it breaks somewhere or another. Uh, and... Uh, Anyway, uh, that's how you solve the other problem. Um, <laughs> just have two of them. It's easy. Uh, but yeah, and the thing is, the other thing is, why, why, why are you doing this in the first place? If you have a parallel program putting all of its data through a DQ, you got a design problem, my friend. <laughs> anyway, um, no silver bullet might be useful. We don't know. Uh, some things to look at if you want to see more about RC or this stuff. Uh, this is the usual slide sponsored by IBM Legal. I don't know if we have time for more questions. Uh, I know we've run over a little bit. Uh, so um, is it uh, break time at this point, tea time? Yeah. OK, so I'll, I'll be here for a little while if you want to ask questions individually, and uh, I'll hand it over to Rachel other than that. All right, so we have run over time slightly. So big round of applause for Paul. Thank you. Thank you. And then we've got a small gift on behalf of LCA. Thank and you, Rachel, and LCA. Yeah. Yeah, so big round of applause and go enjoy lunch. And uh, thank you all for your time and attention.